Hey, well, welcome to what's now San Francisco. Can you all hear me in the back? Everybody good? All right. Well, thank you for braving the weather and coming out. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you're kind of part of something really special. This is the first time we've done two what's nows in one month. So, and the... Uh, and it's a packed house, so speaks to what's now and speaks to the relevancy of, of, of the subject we're going to be going into tonight. Um, well, first of all, welcome. My name is Joe Bojo. I'm with a company called Cap Gemini. Uh, we are, are partners with Reinvent and Pete and, and hosting and running and creating this awesome what's now series of events. Uh, how many first timers do we have to, to what's now? Solid, solid. And I see a lot of familiar faces, so thank you for joining us if you're a, a first timer. Just a little bit of context and orientation to uh, who we are, what we do here during our, our day jobs. We don't uh, uh, just do what's now. So Capgemini is a large global consultancy. We're based out of Paris, France. We have 12 of these around the world. And these facilities called uh, Applied Innovation Exchanges allow us to engage with our largest clients with some of their most significant transformational problems and engage them in uh, active discussions and engage them in places like Silicon Valley. So that's a bit, a bit about what we do here. And the history of what's now is kind of, you know, has a very special place in, in my heart because Pete and I were heavily involved in the, the origins of it. But about three years ago when our company, when Capgemini was setting course to move into Silicon Valley, we knew we had to introduce ourselves appropriately in a really meaningful, authentic way. We wanted to be a part of the community here and you know, not just a facility and a venue. So we started thinking through what are some mechanisms and ways that we could do that. And together with Pete, we conceived of the concept of what's now San Francisco. It's, it's since expanded into what's now New York and we, we are uh, aspiring to do it in more places around the world. And the, the premise is pretty simple. What's going on right now here in, in our environment that is extremely relevant to all of us and how can we bring together a community and exchange and, and have a, a dialogue about the nature of that and bringing in a, a, a constituencies that are very, very diverse. So in the audience today, we probably have folks from corporate, from investors, from, from uh, entrepreneurs and investors and domain experts. So we'll have some great dialogue and get some great content and perspective. And then after that, we'll all exchange more over some, some drinks and uh, look forward to getting to know you and being a part of the community with you. So with that, let me hand it over to Pete to be your host for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Camp Jeb and I. Uh, it's been three years, literally almost to the day we started conceiving this. Uh, it's been a great partnership, as, as he laid out, and we are deep into planning for next year. We've got some interesting things up the sleeves going forward. Now, I'm Pete Lyden. For those that don't uh, know me, the new people that were here, um, I'm the founder uh, of reInvent, the media company here that curates this and also produces it and live streams it. In fact, if you're uh, so moved. Uh, that's the hashtag to talk about. And if you just go to reinvent.net, you can basically get this live streamed uh, going out there with a multi camera shoot here. Um, now, one of the things I use as a curator is I'm always looking for folks that are optimistic about the future. It's not a do or die, it doesn't, it's not an absolute thing that the speaker has to have. But it, over the course of the last three years, we've seen essentially a consistent characteristic coming through in our speakers, our featured guests, of having essentially a can-do optimism. Sure, there's huge challenges out there, uh, daunting, but there's also awesome solutions, and we have everything we can do to actually take on these challenges. And that consistent kind of piece of the program is what's coming off month after month, and it's definitely so tonight. Um, for many of us here in the Bay Area, uh, we've been <laughs> struggling to breathe over the last couple of months, or a couple of weeks, I should say, uh, with the fires up, uh, uh, they're just blazing up there that are really rooted in the climate change. And uh, we've been viscerally feeling this over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and while all Amer Americans were having Thanksgiving and playing touch football and stuff, um, the Trump administration dropped a very sobering report uh, slipped it in there quietly on Friday, uh, really pointing out that we've really got about a dozen years here to really move fast, uh, or we really face an extremely uphill challenge here to kind of kind of get a, a ourselves moving in this uh, taking on climate change. Uh, now, when even the when the Trump administration come around to this, I mean, even though we don't really have the president himself kind of embracing it, 
we know we've kind of gotten past the debate really on, uh, on whether or not this changed. It's really about how we're going to solve this thing. And so while people can be very pessimistic, given what I just kind of laid out there, and many people want to wallow in that pessimism, uh, our speaker today is not that guy. And he's, again, the opposite of that. Now, Hal Harvey um, has just come out with a new book here, Designing Climate Solutions. That is a very can-do book with pr concrete, practical, proven solutions of how we can really get our hands wrapped around uh, bring, keeping the CO2 emissions down enough to actually make sure we do stay below two, uh, two degrees Celsius that many of the experts are saying uh, we really start to get into really, really uh, a point of no, maybe not a point of no return, but a very, very extremely difficult situation. And he actually says we have what we need to actually pull that off, and he's going to talk about that today. Now, how is uh, spent his life thinking about this, his professional life working on this. He was the founder and CEO of the Energy Foundation um, in the world of philanthropy, trying to un kind of give uh, all the efforts around renewable energies and, and uh, uh, energy efficiency. They were kind of promoting all kinds of efforts to do that. He's actually got a global perspective. He did the same thing uh, abroad in China. He was the Energy Foundation China. Got that going. He helped with the European Climate Foundation, getting that off the ground. And he also did one in India called the Indian Sustainable Energy Foundation. He has the global perspective on this global problem. Uh, and now, since about 2012, he's basically has his own firm here, uh, in which he is the CEO, uh, called Energy Innovation. And they spend a lot of time uh, advising people over around, the, around the country, around the world, on the best energy policies and environmental policies to really uh, move fast and move effectively. And he's a, one of the great well authorities on this, uh, extremely well uh, known and well uh, appreciated around the world. And so what we're going to have him today, since the book is just out, and many of you probably haven't read it, he's going to do a little presentation here. He's going to lay out a lot of his big insights um, on this. And a lot of these ideas, by the way, coming out of his life, but also out of his company's life how they've squeezed down the kind of essence of what we really need to be focusing on here. He's going to do a little presentation of this, and as is our way of doing this, I will come up a little after that, and we'll have a little conversation with me and him. Then we'll roll into the conversation with you. And again, one of the beautiful things about what's now, the network we've built here, interdisciplinary over all these years, invite only, is we've got so much brain power in here. There are so many people from all in this industry, Nonprofits, activists, all kinds of folks in here. So we're going to make sure we have a lot of conversation with you. So to start that off, let's uh, give Hal a great uh, warm welcome. What's now? Thank you, Peter. I think with an introduction like that, I cannot fail to disappoint. <laughs> so anyway, um, I know we have a lot of uh, brilliant people here deep in the energy industry. Uh, I'm going to move quickly, but feel free to yell at me if I go in the wrong direction or you protest or, or something you don't like. Um, our new book is called Designing Climate Solutions, and I want to emphasize the solutions part, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about what solutions mean in this space. The scale of this problem and the scale of the remedies we need are almost unimaginable. And speed is of the essence, and I'll get into why in a minute. And the consequence of this is one cannot mess around with trivialities. We, do, we simply don't have time. I heard somebody in here joking. I don't know if they know I heard them joking, saying, yeah, I've heard that if you eliminate plastic straws, you've already got one and a half degrees back. <laughs> okay. So um, it's obligatory when you give a climate change talk to scare the bejesus out of the audience first. So that's how I will begin. Um, but I'm going to actually introduce you to some climate trends that you may not be aware of that are actually more than a little worrying. Most of the talk will focus on solutions, but then I'm going to talk about how we get there. What do we have to do in order to, to, to really win this one? Um, the first thing that has to be said about climate change is it's about the extremes. So all the modeling in climate change for a modeling convention is anchored around global average temperature change. And people talk about two degrees, or one and a half degrees, or five degrees, or whatever s scenario you want. And everybody thinks, well, that's okay. I mean, my bedroom does that every hour, whatever. The point here is that when the averages change a little, the extremes go nuts. And it's the extremes that hurt. And let me show you exactly how this works. So everybody's familiar with a normal distribution of temperatures here. 
about a third of your, sea, your years are colder than average, a third are average, and a third are warmer than average. I'm going to show you real world data from Na NASA about how this has been changing across the United States. So what happens, so this, this starts in the 50s. And you can see these are real world data. Look how nicely they fit that curve. It's pretty astonishing. And you can see the clock moving along. And look what happens in the early 80s. So here we are today. We've moved the average a degree or so. We no longer have very cold winters. One twelfth, not one third of our years are colder than average. And this is actually going away altogether. The um, so-called normal, the middle, is now down to one sixth. Everything is hot now. And look what's happening out at the extremes. There were no temperatures out here in these extremes. So when you eliminate this extreme cold, and when you increase fivefold, tenfold, 15, the extreme heat, that's when catastrophe happens. And that's what humans suffer from. And so this is Thailand, significantly underwater in the huge floods of a couple years ago. Bangladesh, more than half the country has now been underwater under extreme conditions. Imagine a country with 80 million people surrounded by hostile nations going underwater. We're all familiar with the fires. I don't need to say much about this. But think of the combination of factors that cause this. The lack of precipitation, the dried soil, the extreme temperatures. So the natural fire dousing, fire limiting, and then fire dousing capacities are gone. And we've created this extreme engine. Australia had uh, the, most spec the most severe and, and horrible fires, I think, in, probably in human history. What, three years ago? Yeah. It was a, the average temperature in Australia one day, the average across the entire continent was 106 degrees Fahrenheit, right? An, er an area the size of France burned, if I'm not mistaken. It's just, just Armageddon, right? Remember I said we lost those cold temperatures? So a very cold winter kills a little beetle called a pine beetle. If you don't kill the pine beetle, the pine beetle kills the forest. There are now more than 10 million acres of dead trees in the Rockies. So you can fly from New Mexico to Alberta and see dead trees the whole way because we lost that extreme, right? So this is the kind of thing that's happening. So that's bad news number one. The extremes become the norm, and the extremes are what affect us. It's the floods, it's the fires, it's the heat waves, it's the extinction vectors, and so forth. There's another problem with climate change, which is when you provoke nature beyond a certain point, nature can just accelerate what you're doing to it in the first place. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of that. The physics term of this is positive feedback, but psychologists like to think that you're a good guy. So I'm not going to call it that. I'm going to call it a vicious cycle, because that's what it is. So this is 1980 Arctic sea ice, shiny white. Sun comes down, hits the ice, bounces right back into space, highly reflective, called albedo. This is what it looks like now. There are now times when the ice is basically gone. The North Pole is now water, quite often. And the ocean's darker than the ice, and so the heat gets absorbed. So you've taken a reflector and you've turned it into an absorber, so you've accelerated climate change. Climate change accelerates more climate change. Here's the scariest one of all. The vast steps across Siberia, across northern Canada, and across northern Alaska are frozen soils chock full of carbon and methane. Methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, and carbon is, of course, expressed in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. When you defrost this, it goes up in the air. And this alone can add one and a half degrees, just defrosting the tundra. And here's the thing. If we start to defrost it, we can't undefrost it. There's no way you can refreeze the tundra if you let this loose. So we are on the verge and actually beginning now to un un unleash natural systems that will swamp our ability to do anything about it. That's a tipping point. And there's a bunch of tipping points. And they don't happen at 1.5 degrees or at 2 degrees. Every bad thing you do nudges us into worse. The one system that's already run away is ice melt. There are, the IPCC reports do not deal with ice melt in a meaningful way because science can't keep up with reality anymore. And the reason is, is once you start to melt it, it creates this lubrication in the, under the sheets and they shoot down into the ocean. And so you can no longer say, say glacially slow. That phrase is obsolete. Okay, last 
bad news. This is really important carbon math, which most people don't apprehend. On the left is carbon emissions. This is what we do when we drive our cars, when we heat our homes, when we run our factories, and so forth. On the right is carbon concentrations. This is what the world experiences. This is the greenhouse effect over here. So look at how these are related to each other. Here's business as usual. Keep emitting, concentrations keep going up. And look at the numbers over here by the end of the century. 600, 900, 1,200 parts per million. Remember that 450 parts per million is the, is the upper goal of the UN panels, the scientists, right? These numbers, last time we were around here, the, the oceans were 70 feet higher. 70 feet higher, not seven, right? We're nudging that. So let's get smart and immediately reduce carbon emissions, what we do, down to zero. Look what happens to concentrations. They go flat. The concentrations don't go down even when you drive emissions to zero because the carbon dioxide that you put in the atmosphere essentially stays there forever, right? So you have to go to zero to stabilize at any concentration. 350, 450, 550, 650, you still have to drive your emissions to zero. So we have to decarbonize the society. No matter what concentration we want to stabilize that. Let me give you another illustration. Let's say we goof around for another 20, 25 years, and then we go to zero. We're still at zero here, zero emissions, and we're stabilizing it north of 600, 650 ppm. That's, catas that's catastrophe, right? That's games, o games, <laughs> games on, games over. I don't know what it is. But look what we had to do to go to zero from here. You have to revamp a lot of industrial society, utilities buildings, transportation, and factories. But if you wait, you have to revamp that much more. It's harder under almost all scenarios to stabilize at 650 ppm than 450 ppm. It's harder to end up worse. If you're going to go to zero, go to zero now. Don't go to zero when you've built that much more infrastructure, that many more cars, that many more factories. <clears throat> so this argues that time is of the essence. And that was this IPCC report. <clears throat> Excuse me. That water is right here. There's some right there. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, so, so the IPCC report says we have to turn these around in about 12 years. And they're not wrong if you fail to do that. So I'm almost done being the evil, awful human being and moving to solutions. All right, I am done. Um, so what do we do about that? One has to think about the physical systems that emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. At the end of the day, it's not about a treaty, it's not about a treatise, it's not about a bill, it's not about voluntarism, it's about four things, utilities, transportation, buildings, and factories. That's the stuff that's emitting carbon dioxide into the air. And if you don't change those physical systems, you're not in the game. I'm gonna talk about the, the grid today for a couple reasons, um, but I'm happy in the Q&A to talk about some of the other systems as well, because there are, there are technologies and economies and policies that can drive the decarbonization of each system. And that's what our book's all about. <clears throat> I want to talk about the grid for two reasons. One is, is changing the fastest. It can change the fastest, and it has been historically the biggest source of CO2 emissions. Another reason is we have some grid experts here who are in charge of running a grid. But a third reason is if you decarbonize electricity and then you electrify everything, you sort of win, right? If you have an electric vehicle running from a solar power grid, you've taken care of transportation as well as the grid. Okay, so what about these technologies? The magic here comes from learning curves. So this is wind deployments from 2009 to 2015. They're shooting up much higher. And this is in the US, by the way, the global numbers are fantastically greater than this. And here's wind prices over the same amount of time. So wind went from way out of the money to the cheapest power source on the planet in windy areas. And it did that because we built more and more and more windmills. And we learned how to get smarter about them, how to make them capture more energy from the air, how to make them bigger where the winds are higher, um, how to fix their power electronics so they could run at different speeds, how to change their maintenance, how to site them, how to microsite them. We learned and learned and learned and learned. And every time we learned, they got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so the learning curve is your friend. And it wasn't invented by the wind guys. I think transistors and cars and all kinds of other things went down learning curves. But they're, they're pretty magical for what we're trying to get done. Solar, an even more dramatic learning curve. There's solar installs driving up, and there's solar prices. 
almost a 90% reduction in price of solar in the last decade. Staggering, right? So let's start putting some of these things together and see what happens. Light emitting diodes, 95% reduction in price for the same lumen, for the same amount of light. Batteries dropped almost 80% in price already. Control systems, you can't even talk about prices because they're becoming so much more sophisticated. There was no before and after. There's only an after. So let's start putting these technologies together and see what happens. Um, and so I'm going to walk through what does it mean to try to build a zero carbon grid and how fast, how fast can it be done? The first thing that most people think about when they think about a zero carbon grid is, well, the sun doesn't always shine. It goes down at night, and that's actually been proven, too. <laughs> I'm trying to help Mr. Trump with some science lessons here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Distraction. Wind doesn't always blow. The sun doesn't always shine. But you always want to turn on the light. You always want your refrigerator to run. You always want your whatever, whatever your hospital to be powered and so forth. So the immediate instinctive thing to do is, well, we need huge batteries. So for every kilowatt hour that we are going to need on a windless night, we better store it. We better have it available somewhere. It turns out there are half a dozen ways to deal with these problems, of which battery is but one, and in many cases, the most expensive one. So let's walk through some of these, because it is kind of a revolution. I studied power systems planning and engineering school at Stanford, and they didn't teach me any of this stuff. They taught me to turn on power plants when demand starts to exceed supply, and keep going, right? And turn them off when demand goes down. So wherever demand goes, we turn on power plants, we turn them back off again. Makes sense. Um, the first thing is improved operations. That's boring, but let me show you what it really is. This is 15 windmills power variation over time, over the course of time. See how they jump up and down? That's hard to plan around. This is 215. Look how much smoother it is. Do a lot of them and hook them together. Make them heterogeneous, right? The wind in Montana does not correlate with the wind in California. Hook them together, smooth your curves. Right? So you start creating smoothness through geographical distribution. A lot of the variability is predictable variability. You do know the sun's going to go down and that it's going to come back, and you know exactly when. And you can predict wind. Here, wind is in the turquoise and sun is in the sunshiny color. Um, you can predict wind 24 hours in advance as well. And so if you have roughly this picture, you can say, well, we need to dispatch some stuff here, a little bit here, and some more there. So what do we have that's dispatchable? On the renewable energy side, maybe hydro, maybe biomass, maybe geothermal, maybe a power plant that you have to turn on from time to time, but it's not your daily douches. Or maybe we borrow some power from somebody else that's got a slightly different regime going on. So, so let's look at that. The United States has these so-called power pools, although we don't really have that worked out in the West. We have a little one for California. Um, these power pools allow you to swap electricity across geographical boundaries. So they allow you to take advantage of the fact that the wind's blowing in the Midwest, even though it's not blowing in Atlanta, or, or, or ha say, what you, say what you will. Turns out, when you optimize across a lot of systems, it gets a lot cheaper, too. That makes sense, doesn't it? Right? If you can buy power from wherever it's cheapest and cleanest, why not? So they are now saving more than $3 billion a year simply by allowing smart trades to occur across larger geographies. And they're simultaneously making it possible to balance out the variability of renewable energy. Connect stuff, dispatch stuff, do it intelligently. It's more or less a miracle. Let's look at the West a little bit. We don't have an integrated grid across the West. Um, and that's costly and problematic. And so the utilities, with encouragement of California and the other states, have created a modest little back door to do that. It's called the energy imbalance market. And they swap electrons when systems are out of balance a little bit. It's already saving about half a billion dollars a year. But what if we got serious about it? So Seattle never has the same peak demand as San Diego. And there's already copper connecting them. Let them smooth each other out a little bit. Bonneville Power Administration, largest battery in North America. It's just sitting there, water behind the dam. Turn up the valve, get some electricity out. Shut it off, shut it down. What do we use Bonneville Power for? We should use it to balance solar in LA. We actually use it to sell bulk power cheap to data centers, <laughs> or to LA, not to LA, but aluminum production. Yeah, so we're using 
precious dispatchable electricity for bulk uses. That's upside down and backwards, right? We should fix that. And the way you fix that is with policy. It doesn't require magic, and it doesn't require much copper. Most of the hardware is there. Most of the wires are there. So that's the first thing. Obviously cheap. You're taking what's there and just using it more intelligently with policy. The next one is demand response. So again, back when I was learning power systems planning, demand is whatever it is. More people turn on their lights, turn on some power plants. More people fire up their factories, turn on some more power plants. What if instead you started to think about optimizing on the demand side of the meter as well as the supply side of the meter? What does that look like? What does that mean? If you know it's going to be a hot, windless day in Los Angeles or Houston or Atlanta, pre-cool the buildings a little bit. Turn on the power plant. Use some power 4 in the morning, 5 in the morning, 6 in the morning when nobody's using anything. And just cool your buildings down a couple degrees. You can do it within the comfort zone so nobody even notices. But what you did was you took readily available power and you dispatched it instead of hard to use power or hard to get power in the middle of the afternoon when it's really hot and everyone. So you're cycling your air conditioner half the time on and half the time off from noon to 4 p.m. instead of all the time on. It's, it's, and, and so I sometimes say we have batteries in America. We have 100 million large-scale batteries in America already. They're called buildings. And they're thermal batteries instead of electrical batteries, but we can use them that way. We can't get the electricity back out, but we manage the demand side. It's pretty cool. It's pretty straightforward. Here's another example. Hot water heaters. You care about when you turn on your hot water heater that you can take a hot shower. That's all you care about, right? So why can't the hot water heater figure out when to get the electricity out? You're gone all day. Why shouldn't it get it out when there's too much sunshine in LA? Let's heat up everybody's hot water right then. What does that require? A chip and a switch, and those are cheap. And so this is getting done now. There's a gigawatt of aggregated storage. A gigawatt is a Diablo Canyon-sized power plant. It's a huge power plant, right? And you got it for free by turning things on and off that already exist, or more or less for free. Um, these these uh, Nest thermostats, everybody's seen them? There's more than a million houses that have them connected to what they call rush hour rewards. So they pre-cool your house a little bit. You don't even know it's happening, and they sell the reduced demand back to the grid. So instead of the grid turning on a power plant, the grid turns off a demand for power. System still in balance. Price, approximately zero. Let them bid. Let demand side responsibility. So that's the second idea, is, is demand response. How much is there? This is a survey in California of how much demand response is available at less than the cost of generating power, and they found six gigawatts. That's six huge power plants worth, essentially for free. It doesn't happen automatically, however. You have to set up a market for demand that competes with the market for supply on the same terms. OK, so that's the second idea, demand response. The third one is you actually want to build some transmission lines. Remember I talked about moving power around? If you build transmission lines, I'm going to skip ahead one and then go, no, there's a slide missing. That's OK. Um, if you build transmission lines, then you can hook up your renewable energy supply wherever it is to your demand wherever it is. So this is a transmission line that's been permitted and will be built soon. It starts in eastern Wyoming. Who here has been to eastern Wyoming? So what's it like? Freaking windy. It's the windiest part of America. And what's Las Vegas like? Freaking hot. <laughs> hook them up, right? Just makes sense. So if you build these things, you can balance all kinds of, of problems. And it really works. It really does. By the way, this is the largest wind farm in America. And one of the newest transmission lines in America, they're, they're, being, in, they're being financed by a guy named Phil Anschutz, who's a conservative Republican, and permitted by Matt Mead, who's the governor of Wyoming, conservative Republican. It's a state that voted more for Trump than any other state in the union. And they're not doing it because they love hippies or believe in climate change or anything else. They're doing it because they want to make some money. And they know it's going to displace coal, but they know coal's going away anyway. They're not dumb. And so they figure, what does a coal guy do, or a woman? Well, they put in roads, and they dig holes, and they put in cement, and they put up towers, and they string wire, and so forth. Same jobs as the wind farm. So why not build, use the same labor, the same skills, to build the biggest wind farm in the world? That's exactly what they're doing. So is the governor of Wyoming pro-coal or pro-Wyoming? 
It's a good question. So we do have to build some grid infrastructure. The more you hook up the country, the more renewable energy variability vanishes as a problem. Here's one that some of my um, environmental friends want to pitchfork me out of the room with, which is fast ramping gas. So we have a lot more gas turbines in America than we need. They're incredibly cheap to run. So we're running them for bulk power. Forget that. That's not a good idea for, for a climate reason. But it's a really good idea to turn them on for 100 hours a year when you really, really need it. That cold winter night in North Dakota when the wind hasn't been blowing and the sun hasn't been shining. For God's sake, turn on the, turn on the turbine. If you run a gas turbine for two or 300 hours a year, the carbon footprint is negligible. But the balancing power for the grid for renewables is fantastic. So let's do a little math rather than be too precious about how we solve these problems. If you run it for 4,000 hours a year, you've got a problem. How big a problem? I'll show you in a minute. OK. For a long time, people talk about gas as a transition fuel, right? It does emit less carbon dioxide than coal when you burn it. Half as much, about. Half is pretty good. But by the way, half doesn't put you on that yellow line that I showed you, that fast downhill trajectory. But if a little bit of that gas leaks, not so good. So this is 1% leak, 1% methane leak. Look how much gas scraped up on coal. This is 10% leak. How much does gas leak? Actually, nobody knows. We don't monitor it. <laughs> so there's some. But to really monitor it, you have to sample it in situ comprehensively, right? You can, they're, they're surrogates. But the point is, if you, believe in, if you believe gas is a transition to anything, you better the, be the biggest, strongest possible advocate for controlling leaks. So when the natural gas company tells you we're better, then you ask them the question, how big are your leaks? How do you know? Prove to me that you're going to stand up and do everything you can to drive this, these numbers down, or it's a transition to nowhere. And even so, it should be used for specific purposes, not for bulk power. OK. Last, energy storage. I love batteries. I love energy storage. And we, shouldn't, we should continue to drive them down the learning curve. But there are many kinds of energy storage. This is a pumped hydro system, right? You pump water uphill when you have excess electricity. You run it through turbines when you don't have enough. Pretty straightforward. A couple moving parts. It's hard to cite these things, but a lot of them exist already. This is a bank of batteries. Batteries have gone down in price. I can't remember the exact number, but something like 80% in the last decade. And the batteries that I never thought would work for bulk power storage are the ones that are killing it, which is lithium ion. Um, so there are fantastic opportunities with storage. The point is, if you walk, th oh, here's the battery cost curve right here. If you walk through all those options and you become a system optimizer instead of just somebody who turns power plants on and off, you can balance out, out renewables at an incredibly low price. So the zero carbon, highly reliable grid is cheaper and more reliable. Reliability has gone up in the jurisdictions that have added the most renewable energy to the mix in America, not down. And same in Germany, by the way. Reliab the most reliable grid in the world is one of the most renewables intensive grids in the world. So it does take a new paradigm, um, but it's possible. I have no idea what this means. Oh, <laughs> you've seen this all. OK, how do we get there? Policymakers. Who decides? And how do you influence them? And this is maybe the most important part of this talk. So it's not always obvious how to direct one's energy if one cares about climate issues. But it really, really pays to figure out where the biggest carbon abatement opportunities are and who controls whether they happen or not. I call this venue analysis. We have to have speed and scale to get the job done. Plastic straws don't do it, right? It's fine. By the way, divestment, does divestment affect carbon emissions? Nope. Nobody shuts down coal plants because of a lack of capital. They shut down coal plants because of a lack of return on capital, which comes from the demand supply balance, right? So you can divest all you want. Somebody's going to invest in those coal plants if they can make money. You either shut it down by fiat or by crushing demand or by outcompeting, right? Those are your options. And, and I say this not because I think divestment is a powerful moral idea, but if you think changing your stock portfolio changed carbon dioxide, you're not doing your homework. And we have to do our homework. We can't afford to mess around. Okay, 
Speed and scale, and last and not least, venue. Who decides? So I'm going to do a little bit of decision maker math here. I know you guys are on the edge of your seats. Um, we don't have to invent new sources of money. This is a very important part of it. The world spends $5 trillion a year on energy and an additional $6 trillion on the infrastructure that determines our energy consumption patterns. There's no way we're going to get a bond passed in Sacramento that measures in any way against those numbers, right? It's not, a, it's not a question of inventing new money or making new investments. It's a question of diverting existing cash flow from brown choices to green choices. We have to take the existing cash flow, move it where it matters. Who controls existing cash flow? When you write a check for $212 to your local utility at the end of the month, where does that money land? That's a really important question. Because those guys, whoever, whoever, whoever answers that question, decides whether we land on a reasonable climate future or complete freaking disaster. So here's who it is. Uh, this, isn't, this is the wrong, there we go. In America, it's done state by state by state. There's nobody in Washington that decides where your, your utility bill goes. In fact, Washington doesn't do that much energy policy. The Secretary of Energy has one energy policy responsibility, which is to set appliance and equipment standards. They do re research and development, but they don't dispatch the grid. They don't set fuel efficiency standards for cars. They don't set building codes. They don't do industrial energy efficiency. They don't do a carbon cap, and they don't do a carbon tax. That's done state by state. So don't go to Washington with your flags and your protest signs and stuff like that, or your letters to your congressman, because the congressman doesn't decide this stuff. 50 states decided individually. Who decides it in, the, in your state? Does your governor? Maybe. Maybe some influence. But fundamentally, it's the Public Utilities Commission, the three most boring words strung together on the planet. <laughs> but they have the fate of the earth in their hands, right? And so when a Public Utilities Commissioner tells PG&E or Baltimore Gas and Electric or Exelon Power, I need you to increase your renewable energy by 3% a year and don't stop. I need you to invest a significant fraction of your revenues in energy efficiency and don't stop. And by the way, don't impinge on reliability. They'll get to work. They'll do it. It happens again and again. Utilities in Colorado were fighting, fighting, fighting against renewable requirements. And then they discovered it's cheaper and it's better. And now they're out ahead of the government. They're insisting now on 55% renewable energy by 2030 in Colorado. We have states now that are moving to 100% renewable energy by 2040 or 2045 or 2050, by law. But what do you, how do we make this happen? How do we accelerate it? How do you make it happen to different things? Well, if you have 50 states and they each have a public utilities commissioner, that's 250 individuals that control more than half the carbon in the economy. Why do they control it? Because they're a monopoly function of pipes and wires. 250 individuals control more than half the carbon in the economy. Pay attention. Damn it. <laughs> um, turns out, remember scale? 20 states don't matter. They're too little. So let's go for the big states. We're now down to 30 states. That's 100 in, 150 individuals that control almost half the carbon in the economy. We don't need a 5 to 0 vote on those commissions. I'm perfectly happy with a 3 to 2 vote. So now you're down to 90 individuals. So this is now getting interesting, right? How do these guys make decisions? What convinces them to take your money and move it from a brown choice to a green choice? Turns out they live in a quasi-judicial forum, right? They have dockets. They have hearings. They take evidence. They take testimony. They make decisions. They live in a statutory framework. They live in an economic framework. If you master the framework in which they live, and it's not for amateurs, you have to do your homework, then you can affect these 90 people. You can use public pressure with op-eds in the newspaper. You can have private meetings with them. You can show economic analyses. You can prove that the system will be reliable. You can bring in doctors who deal with asthmatic children and let them talk to you about what it means to live downwind of a coal-fired power plant. You know exactly where to put the pressure on these 90 individuals. Choose one state, choose two or three commissioners, and find the argument that's going to work best for them. And then get sophisticated about how they make decisions because they can only make decisions within certain parameters. You have to understand how they make decisions or you're not in the game. So this is what I call venue analysis. It turns out that for the transportation system, 
for buildings and for industry, the number of actors is quite small. But they're not necessarily who you think, and they don't react to generic protest or awareness or divestment or whatever. You have to get in there and understand what's going on. If you do that, you can flip things. And that's what happened. 28 states passed renewable energy requirements. Texas was the first. George W. Bush, governor of Texas, signed the first one. Texas blew past those goals because wind turned out to be cheap. They did another one, blew past those goals. Now it's gotten so far that the regulators just stand out of the way and let the cowboys build windmills. And it's just fine. So it's, it's happening. So you have to understand, you have to know the things, and then you have to get in there and focus and focus. If we, if we fail at this job of identifying the decision maker, if we fail at the job of understanding the venues, and if we fail at the job of effectively intervening in these venues, we fail on climate. It's that simple. So I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a hell of a lot easier to be intensively focused on the what, the why, the where, and the how than to just be efforting away and hoping something good happens. All right. Um, I'm going to wind this up with a couple slides. Um, I'd sometimes say we're in the race between two nonlinear non systems. That runaway feedback that natural systems release is a nonlinear system. You, 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 you add heat to the system, and then it goes berserk. Well, we've got another nonlinear systems, which is the price and the scaling potential for clean energy. I've talked about solar and wind a lot, but there's dozens of these options across. When you're in a race between new, two nonlinear systems, it really matters which ones you nudge first and how fast you nudge them, because they do snowball. They do get going on their own. So that's what I wanted to present to you, and we'll have a conversation about it. Um, I will say, the last thing I'll say, my, my colleagues, Jeff Risman and Robbie Orvis here, did fantastic works on this book. This is a detailed policy guide about what matters and what works. It's not always the stuff you think. Um, and we wrote this because we, we studied hundreds of policies and built a very careful policy model that looks at the effects of different policies and, and discovered that there was a huge difference between some incredibly effective strategies and many that were Sweet, but didn't get the job done. So, thank you. Fantastic. Why don't we sit here and chat a little bit? Um, let me just move this one second. Folks, I tell you, I saw enough people taking this photos from the slides there that uh, clearly you struck a nerve on a bunch of folks here, as you did with me. Um, I'm gonna just going to pull out a few different things and, like I say, get into a conversation with you folks pretty quickly here. But um, I started this thing that you were an optimist. And, uh, and you started your talk with the fear factor. Um, can you say a little bit about how confident or how not confident, or, or, or where, where do you fall in that, our ability to really pull this off realistically? Because uh, you, you laid a way out, you saw how we could do it, you gave pressure points in policy, but pulling back from the whole thing, where are you? You use the word pressure points, it's a good word. Um, I think if we take the collective energies of people who do care and apply them on the right pressure points, we're gonna be okay. Um, I think if we dissipate them in a hundred different ways, we won't. Um, so it's a matter of focusing our energy quickly. The other thing that I am animated by is the snowball effect. This, this, um, uh, you know, with <clears throat> each each solar panel you put in makes the next one cheaper, mm -hmm. and that makes the next one cheaper, and so forth. And the status quo. Re so the the biggest problem we have now is no longer technology, and no longer economics. It's status quo resistance. It's the oil companies willing to spend 35 million bucks to defeat a carbon caps in one little state, Washington state, right? So when you have grown-up technologies, you get grown-up enemies, and we got them. So how do you deal with the status quo? You out status quo them. I mean, I don't, that sounds sort of silly, but there are more solar installers in America than there are coal miners by a very large factor, right? They're not organized. They're not charismatic. They don't have, they're not cultural icons, but they're real people with real jobs doing real work. Right, so it's, it's Matt Mead putting in the biggest windmill in America, the governor of Wyoming. That's the kind of flip we need to get to by building momentum. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm optimistic. I think, I guess I would say we need a pointed effort rather than a general one, and then I'm really optimistic. 
appointed effort meaning, say more about that, what, what, what you're asking for there. Um, a real well, consensus quickly forming in the country and around the world that's really moves fast in ways that it hasn't so far given. So, so, so Paris and the, the first reaction most people have to any difficult problem was if only the public knew X, then everything would be okay. And that's a very wonderful Jeffersonian ideal. It's not, however, the way the world works. Um, the way the world works is decision makers live in, a, in tightly constrained parameters with lobbyists or appointment issues or statutory problems or economic, and they have to make a choice within that. So you have to find the dynamics of the decision-making system and then marshal your forces. You can't expect everybody in America to stand up and insist on them doing the right thing. So you have to find who are the hundred people who can make that decision happen. And don't, don't, or the don't, 90. don't do it with, or the 90. <laughs> don't do it with instinct, right? Do it with, you know, do they go to church? Did their pastor say something? Do they have an asthmatic kid? That could be pretty important, right? Is there a windmill factory in their jurisdiction? Is electricity cheaper in Kansas and Iowa because they have a lot of wind than it is in Arkansas where they don't have much wind? You, you know, you have, to, you have to be sort of super clever about how you marshal your people, your talents, your thoughts, your ideas, and your political convictions. Now, one of the things, you know, we're in here at What's Now San Francisco, we've been pulling innovators from all these different fields over the last three years. And so there's been a kind of a California is the future kind of theme that yeah. we keep playing with. Yeah. How do you think, what do you think the role is for California? We've got a new governor who's mm -hmm. very, you know, tuned in. We've come off a governor who's been very good about climate. Uh, we've got super majorities of Democrats who seem to be into it. Do you feel that there's a kind of a special moment here that California could really... Um, really lead the way in a different absolutely, way? Absolutely, absolutely, and it's working. So I do a lot of work in China. I've made at least 70 trips to China now, working with them on more than 100 energy policies. And um, they all want to come to California. Of course, they want to breathe some fresh air, get some suntan, <laughs> but they also want to learn. They don't want to go to Washington. Can't blame them. Um, and and there, are, uh, there are amazing opportunities. The, the California systems are meritocratic and sophisticated in an unparalleled manner, I would say. There's nobody except the US EPA that has the environmental sophistication of the California Air Resources Board. Um, there is nobody, there are very few public utilities commissions that have a tenth the sophistication of the California Public Utilities Commission. So that's part of it. The other part of it is we have a very smart cap and trade system, the best in the world, and it hasn't killed the economy. It didn't crush us. Like, who knew? So, so that was the prognosticators of doom. We're talking about gasoline being $8 a gallon and so forth. Really? You know, 17 bucks on a ton of carbon, which is what the permits are selling for, is 17 cents on your gallon of gas. I don't think that's going to kill the California economy. So we have a lot to do. But we have to be careful not to get caught up in techno-utopia, right? Just inventing cool stuff down there in the valley is not going to solve the problem. If you don't have a public policy framework, it doesn't happen. But it sounds like you feel we do, and we now, yep. now, now you're kind of describing where we are now. How would we, given the dire, you know, look ahead, what would you want to see happen in the next two or three years here, given all this new blood, new energy, and this yep. kind of political kind of well, the first thing is going, coming together. Here. The first thing is a boring thing, which is to execute on the amazing legislation that California legislature passed and that Governor Brown signed in the last couple of years. Uh, moving to 100% renewables, an executive order to move to 100% carbon-free for the rest of the economy. Um, so, the, so the grid is by law, the rest is by executive order. Um, we have a steadily tightening building code. We have one of the best building codes in the world in California. It gets tighter automatically every three years. That's pretty cool, right? Policy should have continuous improvement built in. So I'll give the counter example. Gerald Ford was president during the first oil crisis, 1974. And um, <clears throat> we tanked the U.S. economy because we had to get so much oil from the Middle East, and they decided to embargo us because of the Yom Kippur War. And so oil prices went kablooey, and we entered a period of simultaneous recession and inflation, stagflation, they named it, and it was a mess. It was very hard to fix. So Gerald Ford, advised by an interesting guy named Dave Freeman, who some of you probably know, um, <clears throat> decided to double the fuel efficiency of cars from 13 miles per gallon, remember the 1972 cars, to 26 miles per gallon. So when you double the fuel efficiency, you have the fuel consumption as they enter the fleet. This crushed OPEC. It crushed the oil, petroleum exporting countries cartel. 
It's a demand-driven destruction of our oil appetite. By the way, demand, you have to, just, you have to control demand to, to deal with oil. You can't stop it by controlling supply. The oil world is fungible. But, he, but Gerald Ford made a big mistake. He set a number, 26 miles per gallon, or 27. <clears throat> he didn't set a rate of change. That would be brilliant policy, 4% a year. Because then it would have gotten better in 1976, and I, I mean 1986 and 87 and so forth. Instead of stopping at 1985 and going flat, flatlining until Obama and, well, George W. Bush, and then Obama doubled it again, we would have saved a trillion dollars, which we sent to countries that hate us, if he had changed that one sentence instead of 26 miles per gallon, said 4% a year. So continuous improvement is a, design, a policy design principle that we emphasize in this book. And you can do that with utility performance standards. Why say 50% renewables? Why not say 3% more a year? Why s and that's what Jerry Ford, when he was the youngest governor in California's history, did with the building code. It gets tighter every three years, like it or not. And uh, we went through Republican administrations, Democratic administrations, and it's the gift that kept on giving. Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to open up a couple little spaces here that people might want to build on later. Is The book starts by... Um, looking from the global perspective yep. and saying there's basically 20 countries in the world that really matter, just like there's only so many states that really matter. And, um, and the two big ones, and the biggest one is China, and the other one's the US. You said you've been to China, whatever, 70, 80 times you just said there. Um, what are you feeling about uh, our partner, our, our, our superpower partner in kind of solving this uh, for good, positive, and negatives that are going on over there? That gives us hope, because this, yeah. again, even if we got our act together here, we obviously got to pull this off globally. Yeah, yeah. Th you know, the brightest moment for that partnership was in the run-up to the Paris Agreements, when the United States and China signed a bilateral agreement to dramatically reduce carbon emissions. And they did it to make a difference in the world. They're the two largest emitters. But they also did it to, s to set the template and the example for the Paris Treaty. Um, we're in the habit of tearing up treaties because they were signed by the wrong guy is silly in the extreme, right? If, if, if China voluntarily cuts its pollution, we're opposed to that? How does that work? I don't get it. So, so the good news is um, China is run by, it's a, merit, it's a meritocratic government and it's run by technocrats. Everybody in China government is an engineer. Um, not quite, but pretty close. And, and they understand pollution and they understand global warming. They don't argue about science. And they understand cost curves. And they screw up with policy sometimes, but sometimes they do some good things. And talk about a machine that scales. That's called mm -hmm. China, right? And one of the reasons solar and wind are so cheap is because the Chinese government got serious about producing a lot of it, the China price, right? Yeah. So um, all we have to do now is show a modicum of respect, which we can do through California. California and China have MOUs on energy. Not United States and China, California and China. And by working with them on training and building systems, which they're eager to do, as I mentioned before, um, by taking advantage of the cheap, clean energy they want to sell us, we put tariffs on solar panels. Something wrong with that? No, I know. Like, what? Anyway, so uh, j let's go, jumping back to the treaties. The, the language in the treaties for years, so the Copenhagen Treaty, was burden sharing. Who will incur the burden? And I always try to imagine, that. what if we ask the Chinese, well, we'll reduce our carbon emissions if you give us a ton of solar panels, really cheap. They would have shouted us out of the room. You're out of your mind, you know? We, we can't subsidize your solar. That's exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. And so then we put tariffs on them for, for that. I mean, there's a certain madness at foot here. We have to get past that. Well, you, you're kind of alluding to it here, but uh, the Trump administration, you know, <laughs> Do you see this as a temporary backlash and a kind of bump in the road, or do you see this as a looming disaster? Or, or how, how far could this put us behind, um, given your kind of urgency that you laid out there? Um, I, I guess I see Trump as part of a, a truly frightening global trend, which is the strongman leader. And so if you look at Erdogan in Turkey, or Xi Jinping in China, or Putin in Russia, or um, Duterte in the Philippines, and so forth, these are people who know the truth, work from their gut, and are willing to squash anybody and everybody who gets in their way. Um, and for reasons I cannot fathom, they've made environment one of their enemies. 
I, I don't understand why you could be against clean air or clean water or reasonable climate as a political matter. I don't understand it for any other reason either, actually. Um, and so we have somehow, and, you know, cancer is not polarized, right? Drinking water is not especially polarized. Everyone wants it. Poisoned meat, that's not a polarizing issue. Nobody wants that. So why did we let some things slip into polarizing issues and not others? And I think the only way out of it is not to have a frontal conversation about climate change. Th th those camps are set. They're not going to move. Instead, go straight to solutions, clean energy solutions. And let Republican governors, two-thirds of all renewable energy in America has been installed in red states. That's great. And they don't have to live by the same ethos that you or I might live by. They just have to put in a lot of windmills. It sounds like you're feeling good about that. Okay, that's all good. <laughs> well, you do what you do, right? Um, one this other little plug for the book, because we focused here on the grid, but I just want to say there's a whole section in transportation yep. there. There's a whole thing on building efficiencies, there's a, or particularly industry. And so just maybe just a kind of last kind of comment or two on, you know, each of this, those sections, you have the same yep. kind of rigorous way to analyze it and come up with ideas. But that in your set of analysis, just like cut the crap, don't do the stuff mm. that's not effective, you're just saying energy grid, industry, right. transportation, and uh, buildings. And buildings. Yep. Could you just say a little bit more about that? And, yep. and we won't have to go into detail, but to say uh, it's actually good to encourage you to actually look at the book at how you uh, go at all those. So let me start with buildings. If you if you build a building properly, if you insulate it well, um, if you wrap the ducts, if you put in a decent heating system, if you have a decent control thing, and, and if you choose your windows well and think about overhangs for shading, these are simple things, right? These are, these are building elements that were mastered by the Greeks and the Anasazi Indians. They're not magic, uh, although the windows, they didn't have the windows. Um, <laughs> then you reduce your energy consumption by about 80%. If you throw some solar panels on the roof, you can wipe it out entirely. Not everywhere, but in lots of places. 80% is a pretty good number. By the way, we don't need to go to 100%. Like, that's, let's get most of the way there and then retire and let our kids have something to do. <laughs> so um, the only policy that delivers great buildings is a great building code. You can have architectural training programs, you can have energy efficient mortgages, you can have a lead labeling system, you can, you know, there's many ideas, there's only one that delivers, which is a great building code. So that's a good thing to know. And then you want to go where the buildings are being built. We're not building that many buildings in America. We're building a lot of buildings in China and Egypt and Southeast Asia and so forth. So great building codes in the fast growing countries, India, that's what we got to do. And that's just math. Okay. And how hard is that? Who decides the building code? It's often a national issue. And they're going to decide it based on do we have the technology? Do our builders know how to do it? Is anybody against it? Is it going to cost money or save money? And then there's these co-benefits. It'll reduce pollution in my city. Well, that's a problem. Or it'll reduce electricity demand during peak moments. That's an issue. So you have to figure out who gets to decide whether there's a new building code in India. How does it get enforced? And what are the parameters of their decision making? And that's where you focus your energy. So it's the same methodology. In the building. And in then the, the same thing, I guess, in transportation, it's electrifying. So fuel, fuel efficiency standards are a, a, a yeah. kick-ass strategy, right? right. Um, again, they have to be designed well. If you misdesign them, the worst, the, the thing that pains me the most is when we muster the political force to design a new policy and then we muff it in the design. So in America, we have loopholes for trucks. 1973, that was a Ford 150, hauled a lot of hay. In America today, that's two-thirds of every car sold is classified as a truck, all those SUVs. And trucks get to live by a softer standard. Okay, that was stupid. We shouldn't do that again. In Europe, they had no enforcement and no, and no uh, measurement of real-world performance. And that's why we had the diesel scandal. They were building car after car after car, millions of cars a year that violated every rule there was. And nobody busted them. In China, they regulated engine displacement so you just make the engines littler, and you turbocharge them, and then they have like a big engine, and you get the tax break, and you burn the same amount of gas as if you did nothing, right? In Japan, they have a test cycle that's so soft that it has nothing to do with reality. So those are instances of taking the one killer app, the most important climate policy we've ever adopted worldwide, and not doing it right. And that's part of what the book's about. You have to do these things right. So you are, without question, the most fascinating policy wonk I've ever talked to. <laughs>
<laughs> everything comes Damn back to policy. Everything <laughs> comes back to that's going to solve the day. And uh, I think with that, let's open it up to there's a lot of interesting characters here. Uh, so uh, here's what we do. Raise your hand, and we're going to run a mic to you. Stand up. Say who you are and give a little perspective on and whatever you're, you're thinking. So let's, let's start right here. We'll go for it right here. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. My name's Colleen Cradell. I'm from Next10. Met a while back. Yes. Um, so I wanted to go back to the idea of California being the future yep. on a lot of this stuff. We have done really well at decarbonizing the energy sector, and you talked about a lot of the opportunities moving forward. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do on the transportation sector, so I want two-part question. One is on the energy side, one on transportation. You talked about the grid, yep. and we've been fighting to extend our grid and uh, create a regional grid market beyond the EIM for decades now, is my understanding, in California. It seems like a lot of that will was built up with Jerry Brown, and, and the hope kind of fell through. And so I'm wondering, first part of the question, what you think about the prospects for a regional grid in California and the West moving forward? And the second part of the question is on the transportation side of things. Those emissions are increasing in mm -hmm. California mm -hmm. and across the state. CARB is releasing report after report about how we're not hitting our targets. We've set a lot of great policies, and we keep you know, extending them into more ambitious policies. The technology is there but we're, we're really missing the mark. So I'm wondering what you think are the biggest leverage points on the transportation side in the next five years as well. Two easy questions. <laughs> Too easy. And in fact, in general, I think we'll take those two, but try to keep one. Just to, there's a lot of people here. So expanding the grid. Um, it's, it's highly advantageous, as I talked about up here, to have an interconnected grid. Um, Right now, the California independent system operator controls the California grid, the California ISO. Fantastic, fascinating place. Um, and the California ISO board would love to integrate across a broader area, but <clears throat> it makes the legislators in Sacramento feel they would lose control over our power system. They would not get to decide what gets dispatched. I think that's a false fear. Um, because it's already under the regula regulatory auspices of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, but it's a real fear. And exactly symmetrically, the governors of Wyoming and Utah and Arizona don't want California dispatching their power plants. So it's, a, it's nativism writ into electric policy regulation. It's kind of silly. Um, I don't think it's easy to fix that because who really cares? Only nerds. Um, but I think there are backdoor ways to fix it. The, en the energy imbalance market, we can, we can just keep adding features, keep creating trades, trade more things, trade more volumes, do different things. We can probably get a good fraction of the way there without winning the political battle. And I, and I wish it were not so, but it's a workaround, MacGyver. Um, transportation, the, fundamentally you, you can try to decarbonize fuels. The only way to do that is to switch to electrics. There are not decarbonized liquid fuels, and we're not going to see them at speed and scale, my two favorite words, in the near future. Um, uh, so, so you can decarbonize the fuel by switching to electrics, and you can do that by um, carrot or stick, right? You can have a carrot, which is you can go on the, uh, the HOV lanes, or you can get a tax rebate, or you can park for free, all those nice things. That's a good idea. Um, or the stick, you just simply prohibit the sale of too many internal combustion engines unless they're sold alongside electric vehicles, and that's the Air Resources Board. And increasingly, cities across Europe are saying no more internal combustion engines in the downtown. That's kind of cool. By the way, you should take a look at, this is a great opportunity for fleets, right? Because a bus trolls the city for 16 hours a day. Uh, it goes slow, it stops and goes. It's perfect for electric, because the pollution exposure is maybe 160 times what a car's pollution exposure is. So you can afford more cash to convert the bus than you can to convert the car, because you're getting much more duty cycles and much more exposure both. The other, though, is to stomp on demand for cars or for driving for single occupant vehicles. Now, again, there's a techno-utopian idea that if we automate everything, cars will be all shared and they'll be more efficient. And that's possible, but it's just not inevitable by any means. The opposite could be the point. I could, ha I could take my autonomous vehicle to work, and I don't want to pay 36 bucks to park it, so I'll just have a driver around the city all day. Right? Why not? Because that's cheap. Um, or... Uh, if you add highway lanes, there's something called induced demand. You induce more traffic. Well, compressing more cars into the same number of lanes is functionally exactly the same, right? So you do need policy. I, I think the way to, the policy that works is you make transit faster, better, cleaner, safer, more convenient. 
than the private car. Give them the exclusive lane. Put Wi-Fi in there. Put cappuccino machines in there. I don't care. And then at the end of the line, instead of that last mile, call it the last mile. Jump on an electric scooter or a shared electric bike, right? The last mile technology is this microtransit is going to change transit. But we have to invest in transit as if it's a world-class first choice system, not the runt of the litter that we ignore, which is what we do today. Totally right. Um, there's a woman here, but let's see hands on, on who to, uh, sorry, there's a lot of folks here, but let's, so let's start <laughs> at you, uh, one question and just identify yourself and give a question and then, oops, can we get, no, is it turned on? Oops, do we get in it? So we got another mic. Yeah, just use the other mic. Susan up. Christie. <laughs> We're clear on that. <laughs> Yes. Need refrigerators and air conditioners. What are we going to do? Yeah. Yep. So this is a very good question. There are a number. Of, carbon dioxide is the biggest greenhouse gas warmer, but there are a number of others, like methane I mentioned. But also, the most refrigerants are very potent, and the refrigerant is a, in theory, a closed loop, uh, phase change material um, that allows you to pull cool or warmth into a building. Um, and they're in refrigerators and air conditioners and so forth. Um, we need to phase out uh, HFCs. Um, we need to do it rapidly. It's incredibly cheap and you get a... It's a policy issue. It's a policy issue. You, so basically you have to forbid, as the Montreal Protocol did, instead of ozone depleting refrigerants, greenhouse gas warming refrigerants. There are substitutes. Some are proprietary. Um, DuPont, Dow has some, BASF has some, and some are generic like propane or actually CO2 itself can be a refrigerant. So uh, you need a policy that wipes this stuff out and there's a, there's a, there's a concerted effort to do that and do that rapidly. It, it got a big boost um, when over 160 nations signed an amendment to the Montreal Protocol to, to drive that out, the Kigali amendments from Rwanda. But um, that program is only going okay, right? It's going slow. And there's a lot of resistance, and you're back to status quo enemies. It's, there's not, it's not an economic problem, it's a status quo problem. Uh, so it needs, it needs an, a significant political push to, to get it over the top. China's the goal here. China's the key here. They make 70% of all air conditioners in the world. Okay, we have it in the back here, and then we have here, and then, um, and then I, I see there's a lot of hands, so we'll try to get as many as we can here. So go ahead in the back. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. I'm Arjun. I'm 25, I guess. Uh, Is that your occupation? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me. Uh, I guess I wanted to first just, uh, I guess, suggest a solution to the one of the things you would mentioned, which is, you know, why would anyone possibly be against solving climate change or, you know, solving these problems? Why are so many, why is there this sort of mass movement in the world that seems to be contrary to what seems to be logical? And... I think it's fairly clear that the people and interests that sort of control the levers of power and capital have very clear requirements about, you know, generating profit and growth at the expense of mm -hmm. sort of long-term thought, right? And that is inevitably going to lead us to sort of being, you know, a boiled frog. Um, and so my question is this, you know, l policy is great but it requires sort of holding those levers of power, right? And there's also a lag in sort of when policy can take effect and start to lead to returns. Um, but one of the sort of scariest figures that I've ever seen is the one that you showed with the two, line, the two sort of straight lines going to zero, which is from the IPCC report on page eight. And the, um, I guess my question is, just how do we, how and when do we acknowledge that sort of policy within existing frameworks isn't going to be sufficient? And what do we do at that stage to sort of take more radical steps, um, both with policy and possibly with sort of, ge you know, wide scale geoengineering or sort of last scale, you know, last ditch solutions to solving this? Hmm. Well, um, one does. That's another easy one. Yeah, one does need to impress upon decision makers 
the consequences of their action or their fail to act, their failure to act. So um, I'm heartened by the last election, not just because uh, a lot of people ran on climate and got elected, half a dozen, more than half a dozen states, governors, but because the demographics of who voted changed, uh, especially for midterm election, got a lot better. Um, the, the first thing we cannot do is, is let that dissipate, right? So you vote, you win, you follow up, and you don't blink in between those steps. You just keep going. And so we have to work with and support the political leaders who came into office so that they are rewarded for doing the right thing. Because you know they're going to get beat up. I mean, the oil companies are doing this right now, right? And what are we doing, right? We think we, we, we had a green wave. We're happy. We're done. No. I mean, there's, I think it was Woodrow Wilson said, I know, I know what the right thing to do is. Now make me do it. So, so, so that's the first thing I'd say. And I, and I actually think it's the younger generation that has the greatest potential sway to do that, partly because of lack of voter participation that began to shift. So if there's a way to say this shift is going to accelerate uh, and we are going to hold you accountable, that will be meaningful. That will be really meaningful. If you look at the demographics of the Sierra Club, it's a lot of <coughs> white hairs, right? And, and they're devoted, fantastic, beautiful, wonderful people. They, they, need, the, they need a wave behind them of, of the young. Um, so that's, that, that's the first thing I would say. Since you introduced yourself as 25, I'm going to drop that right back mm -hmm. on you. Um, I'm, I don't, I'm not crazy about these so-called last-ditch technologies of geoengineering. You know, we're going to make, we're going to live with white skies. I mean, if you really want to try geoengineering, go to Beijing. They got white skies. Not that pleasant. A lot of sulfur dioxide up there. Um, uh, carbon sequestration. I talk about speed and scale. 0 for 2. Meaning it would take too long to do it and it wouldn't scale. It's, it's <clears throat> here, I'll give you a statistic that just blows me away. If you took the entire global oil system, every pipeline, every well, every pump, every compressor, every ship, and you ran it backwards, using it to stuff carbon dioxide back down into the ground, first of all, it's dead weight on the economy, right? There's no benefit. You don't get to drive because you did that. You just work and work and work. Second is if you'd use that entire system, which is the largest accumulation of capital in the world, you would solve 1 14th of the problem. Hmm. So do the math. Can't get there from here. All right. I wish you could. I mean, if we, if we squeeze our demand down to very close, fine, fire these doodads up. But we're not, that's, not the, that's not the condition we're up against right now. Totally. Let's hear it. We got a guy over here. Um, Thank you. Okay. All right. We're looking <laughs> good. Uh, my name is Bill, Bill Reschke, and I am with a group called Solar Track, which <laughs> is building an electric tractor. Uh, so that's something we're involved with doing. Um, I just want to thank you very, very much. There's some great chestnuts in this. Last smile. <laughs> some very good things. I wanted to just ask you, you said coal is going to go away. And uh, you spend a lot of time in Asia. I also have spent a lot of time in Asia. And I'm wondering if you can explain hmm. how that actually is going to occur. And I want to squeeze in something else, which is Jevons paradox. You mentioned about efficiency improvements uh, with respect to lighting, lumens, and also cafe standards, and perhaps we could also talk about autonomous vehicles. But do you have any thoughts on Jevons paradox, the rebound effect? Sure. And why? Why is coal going to go away? In your perspective, why coal is going to go away? So I'll do I'll do those in order. The main reason coal is going to go away is because it's more expensive than than the clean alternatives. Um, not everywhere. Not all the time, and that doesn't mean there are not status quo forces that will keep, keep building new coal-fired power plants. There's a lot of coal-fired power plants that are being built in America, or around the world. There's none being built in America. We've wiped them out here and most of Europe. Not Turkey, not Poland. Um, but they're fundamentally going to cost, or do cost, about twice what the alternatives cost. And sooner or later, capitalism shrugs off really inefficient expenditures. Um, so when, Paris, when, when India went to Paris, they said the following, we're going to build a lot of coal. And if you give us a lot of money, we're going to build a lot of solar as well. They should have said, we're going to build a lot of solar. And if you give us a lot of money, we'll build a lot of coal as well. They didn't. But it doesn't matter, because that's exactly what's happening. They can't get them built. They can't get the coal plants built. It's too cumbersome. They're too expensive. Nobody wants to pay the bills. And solar's blossoming. 
I'm, I don't want to be facile about it. We're not, we haven't hit the tipping point in many, many countries, but we've hit them in a number of important countries. So, and I was talking about the US when I said coal's going away. It is going away here. Not fast enough, but it's going away. Um, let me jump to your other question. There's this idea that if you make something more efficient, you'll use more of it because it costs less. And it's carried to its most foolish extreme when people think that efficiency doesn't do any good at all because you double, if you have your electricity consumption, you double your functional consumption. So let's start with the refrigerator, which has gotten 80% more efficient. Do you just leave it open all day because it's more efficient? I don't think so. Um, the Robert Solow, the Nobel Prize winning economist, taught me how to think about this. And, it, and it's a really interesting and so obvious when you hear it. If I give you an extra dollar, you're going to spend it a certain way, or $100 or $1,000. You're going to spend on entertainment and healthcare and education and housing and clothes and all this stuff, right? There's a basket of goods that you're going to buy with your $1,000 I give you. And you can easily determine what that $1,000 is by looking at today's economy, where the marginal dollar goes. If I give you a dollar because I like you or because I let you s get a dollar because you have a more efficient light bulb, you're still going to spend it the same way. Your choices, your desires don't change because of the source of money. So how big is that? We spend about 10% of our money on energy. How big is bounce back? About 10%, a rebound effect. That's fine. I'll take 90% victory. Does that All make right, sense? We're going to go here. Yeah. We, we got them. Yeah. Hi. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, my name is John Love. Uh, I've been working with the Pachamama Alliance for about 20 years. Um, and lately we've been doing presentations about uh, Drawdown, you know, mm -hmm. the, the book and, and Paul, Pro um, Paul Hawkins' project where they map, measured, and modeled 80 solutions for reversing global warming. Um, and a lot of them you've talked about, you know, policy that affects the energy and transportation. Um, but it, he, they grouped them into seven different sectors. And it turn, turns out that the largest sector for reversing global warming, for sequestering and, and uh, avoiding carbon, is actually food. The way we grow, the way we consume food. I wondered if you had any uh, policy uh, recommendations about how to address any of those solutions. So the... Um can, can I just mention, by yeah. the way, Paul launched his book, Drawdown Here, It, uh, what's now, about 18 months ago. Many of you probably were here. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. And there are people from Drawdown in here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, there are differences of opinion about land use and ag, um, but there's no question that there are different kinds of agricultural techniques that, f to produce the same crop, emit more or less carbon. There are different cropping options. There are different diet options as well. And then there's other land use issues like deforestation and afforestation. And if you bundle them together, they constitute 20 or 25% of the total problem. Um, our book is about the other 80-ish percent. It's not about that. Um, the, <coughs> the question gets to speed and scale and number of decision makers, right? And so if you really want to make a difference quick, and we have to make a difference quick, you have to look at that system and say, where are the pinch points? Maybe we can change fertilizer use. Maybe we can move to no-till ag. How would we do that? How would we convince a million farmers in America to go to no-till ag? Well, the extension services or tax credits or whatever. So you have to find the moves that are big that have a relatively small number of decision makers and where there's a pinch point for that decision or you don't have a strategy. So you can't just say, go eat veggie burgers. Yeah. Are applicable. Yes. And it, we just have to figure it out. It, it, it is harder. You have 7.5 billion decision makers, not 90. Right. Okay, we're going to go over here and then Andrew down here. Steve Heckeroth. Um, I'm the founder of Select Track Solar mm -hmm. Electric mm -hmm. Tractors. Um, I started on electric vehicles back when the zero emission mandate came in. And I right away realized the problem was the weight of the batteries. Mm -hmm. And weight in tractors is an asset, where in all other electric vehicles, it's a hindrance. So I've spent the last 25 years developing electric tractors for agriculture, um, which we've just been talking about. And I think is one of the biggest, um, like, should be maybe the fifth thing on mm -hmm. your list there. Um, 
my my problem that I'm having is with the organization that you've you carb, mm -hmm. the organization that um, you've highlighted. Um, first, they turned the uh, zero emission mandate into a hydrogen program, um, which went nowhere. And um, now they are funding, um, they're paying 80% of the cost to replace old diesel tractors with new diesel tractors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that are actually less efficient than the old ones because they're solving the particulates, but they're not solving the greenhouse gas emissions, which are higher. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, my question is, how do you get to these policymakers to make them do what the legislature is asking them to do? I have been, spent nine months trying to get electric tractors certified through yeah. CARB. Uh, it's, it's hard. Nobody likes to take on the ag sector. I mean, farmers, one farmer vote is worth about 50 other civilian votes. I don't know why. But they hold a sacrosanct place in American political culture. Um, I, th I, I, you know, I, I, the reason the Air Board moved on the diesel particulate problem was because they could have a clear inventory and it was a large number and there was a clear solution. And also because it allowed them to put money back into the ag community, which was re reduced political resistance. Remember, the air quality management districts are governed by local officials. And thus, the ones in the Central Valley are not run by San Francisco hippies. Right, so so they're they're going to look for opportunities like that, and I, and I don't blame them. They should. That's exactly what they should do. They're the ones that suffer the exposure, day to day, all day long, sitting behind a diesel smokestack. Um, I think with moving to electric tractors, you would have to make the case that the carbon abatement per dollar was better than other stuff they're funding through the revenues collected from cap and trade. You'd have to show where it snicks in on that dollars per carbon ton abated. And if it's a good number, it's also tough, too, because there's not a big commercial market of electric tractors, so you have a chicken and egg problem. You want the policy pull in order to get the market going, but they can't say the market should be there until the, until the market is there. They're not in the technology development business. Um, but I think that would be my starting point, is dollars per ton. Okay, we're going to get a couple more questions in here before there's more food and drink shortly. But um, we still have a few minutes here, but okay, go ahead here. And then Marty Pickett has... Sorry? Hi, I'm Sandra Kwan, and yeah. I work at LinkedIn. Um, oh, yeah. My question is uh, based on a conversation that Al Gore had with us at a previous company that I was at, mm -hmm. and he was saying that he proposed a carbon tax um, for companies, and then also he also recommended um, that companies incentivize employees to uh, reduce their carbon footprint somehow and incorporate that into their performance management structure so that every accountable every employee is held accountable. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that and um, yeah. Hmm. Um, I, I would I would then I would just put it back onto whether this is scalable, right? Um, one of the things that I was I would not have expected and I've learned that I was wrong was the power of corporations to buy renewable energy. And there's, a, there's an individual in this room who's been an absolute leader in that. So um, corporations have bought, um, I think now it's well over $10 billion worth of clean energy. They created a demand signal. And they did it for environmental reasons, but they also did it for employee recruitment reasons, right? Um, so that's been very powerful. I think, I think if, you, if the employees can basically tell your their employers, this is what it's like to be a citizen. This is what it's like to work for you. Uh, and, and this is constant with my belief. Um, then they can become very powerful actors. The next phase, and again, I'm stealing from somebody much more intelligent than me, is for them not just to buy renewable energy, but to stand up and say, let's accelerate this transition. And I think when we have countervailing business voices, most businesses don't put their neck out in public policy unless it's core to their future. They don't argue, about, and, and so if you see how there are Johnny come lately to almost every social issue. Time to time to poke them, make it central, and the way to do that is through their employees, especially when there's such a talent hunt going on. All right, we're going here, and then okay, and then we're gonna last a couple months. Yep, go ahead. Hi, hi, uh, my name's Tom Speckman. Um, I just had a quick question about. Well, first, just want to thank you for for all of the information this evening. Um, 
Looking at really the supply chain, we talked a little bit about agriculture over here, but on the opposite side, like the beef delivery side and mm -hmm. methane mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. CO2, mm -hmm. really my question is how do we curb and what is that singular contributing factor to greenhouse gases? Yeah. Is it CO2? Is it methane? Is it something else? I see. Yeah. Or, and, and how do we look at coming up with interesting, unique solutions in that food value chain? Yeah, yeah. So the, the biggest pollutant by far is carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and carbon dioxide emissions are hard to clean up because they're the result of thermodynamic processes that literally power every aspect of our economy. Um, and thermodynamics is a unyielding science that gives you one or 2% improvement in a really good year. It's not like chemistry or chips or something like that. Um, so the only way to do it is through the four big systems that emit CO2, utilities, buildings, transportation, factories. The second realm is methane. Jeff Fuel. Say again? Jeff Fuel. Jeff Fuel is kerosene. No, 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 no. It's, it's a hydrocarbon, and when you burn it, it releases CO2 and other, other, other nefarious molecules right, as well. Yeah, but this goes to my question. Yeah. How are you addressing yeah. transportation and water? Yeah. Air travel is one of the toughest. It's about 5% of global emissions. Um, there is no substitute right now except conceivably biofuels. Uh, there, there are some jet planes that run on biofuels. They, they run one engine on biofuels. They run all the others. Biofuels run about years. No, biofuels, biofuels, they, 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 some biofuels can be grown in a way that releases methane, but that's not necessary and it's not normal even for those kinds of, for those kinds of fuels. There's sort of an 80-20 rule at work here that, would help, that should help us focus the mind, which is let's go for cars and trucks first and let's deal with airplanes later because airplanes are much smaller and much harder. And airplanes are already becoming much more efficient by themselves because fuel is so expensive. At the end of the day, we'll either have a synthetic liquid fuel from hydrogen or we'll have biomass fuels. You can't use biomass for very much. There's just not that much of it without damaging farms and soils. But for a specialty use, like certain chemicals and air traffic, air, airplanes, that's, that's the way to go. Am I, am I getting around to your yeah. question? I think it's good, yeah, because we just have to, we have <laughs> that, but that is a good little insight. And, and we're getting to the very end here, uh, but let's, we got a couple more questions, John, here, and then we'll go to Marty. Great. Sounds like you wanted Marty's will be bat clean yep. up here. Okay. Is this on? Yeah, now it is. Okay. Hi, my name is John Odin, and uh, I actually just wrote a book uh, just a couple of months ago. Came out called Distributed Teams. That's relevant. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. Um, I really like the fact that you're talking about what can we do now versus the things that could be done in five, ten years. I've, I've listened to many talks about autonomous vehicles and mm -hmm. the average age of cars on the road in the U.S. is 11 years. So like it's going to take a while for them to become normal, even if they existed. Um, do you know of, uh, and so the book is specifically about how to encourage people to work from home so you don't actually have to commute and deal with all the uh, pollution from all of that. And do you know of any policies or incentives to encourage people to work from home more? Specifically, because we could do it now. I was looking at your yeah. yellow line and it was like, there's no way you can make a society switch at 90 degree easily. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's happening because of congestion. <laughs> I mean, it's a, a lot of companies now say you can work at home one day a week okay. or two days a week or something like that. Um, but, I, you know, you can't drive up and down the peninsula anymore. It's just a nightmare. So Google opens offices here, right? Um, so I, I think the, I actually think it's the private sector that's going to do that without policy. Um, episodically, not uniformly, not efficiently, but... I, I can't imagine a policy, I, I haven't thought about it. I can't off the top of my head imagine a policy that makes that more likely. I don't know what it would be. We'll have to think about it. All right, so, last here, and then there's plenty of time we're gonna be hanging out here with, uh, go ahead. Hey, Marty Krasny, uh, a people question about make me do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Two or three months ago, hundreds of thousands, untold numbers of people got involved with the Kavana nomination mm -hmm. to be one of nine. I don't know anybody who's ever taken a position on a PUC appointee. How do we get, if that's that important, if it's 10 times as many people as the Supreme Court, how do we get to where people like us know what's going on and have an influence? Hmm. It's a really good question. I mean, I actually think it's incumbent upon the environmental organizations um, and good government organizations like the League of Conservation Voters, the League of Women Voters, 
to take a breath, do their homework about what matters and what works, and, and start leaning on it. And it is what we do between elections. Um, and, I, and I think political leaders have a responsibility as well. I mean, yeah, don't use a straw, buy recycled paper, eat meatless Mondays, whatever. But, but if, if we think that that's okay and that's enough, we're just killing ourselves, we're fooling ourselves. So I think, I think there is a special responsibility for people to go beyond the good ideas, ethically reasonable, ethically good, uh, to the things that actually are gonna make a large consequential difference. Um, I mean, that's again, another one of the reasons we wrote the book was to point undifferentiated energy at the few things where the biggest change can be made. It's a, it's a, it's a forcing function, ideally, a focusing function. So that's our hope. With that, I tell you what, here's what we're going to do. Let's give a big hand to Hal Harvey. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I know I saw a bunch of hands out there. That he'll be here for the next half hour. There's food. There's more drink. Stay here. And this is the last one of the year here, folks. So we had a great year, uh, but we got more up our sleeves coming up. So uh, keep an eye out. And thank, you, thank you very much, Peter. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks.